Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Google Plus Hangout, an edition of Book Trip and Maramash Media. Uh, we are so excited to be welcoming Jamie McGuire today, the number one New York Times bestselling author. Uh, and her most recent release, which comes out November 1st, is Sweet Nothing. Jamie has written the international best-selling Beautiful series, the Maddox Brothers series, as well as Providence, Happenstance, and Red Hill. Welcome, Jamie. We can't thank you enough for joining us today. Good to be here. Uh, so let's jump right into Sweet Nothing, because I think that's uh, top billing for right now. Um, tell us a little bit about the story and um, your work with, along with another New York Times bestselling author, Teresa Mumert. Mummert, yeah. Mummert. Um, Teresa and I, about a year ago, we were talking about the idea of possibly writing a book together. Um, we talked about some ideas and figured out quickly that we had had kind of the same idea-ish about a plot line, and so we kind of put that together. And then about six months later, started writing it. It's a new adult. Um, relationship centered kind of like beautiful disaster is mm -hmm. um, with a huge ginormous twist and it was Ooh. this book was written with the purpose of just blowing people's socks off we wanted um, both of us kind of like to write tw twists in our books okay. so we really wanted to uh, we really wanted to, to write with the intent of no one knowing what on earth was going on, um, but still being able to enjoy the story until the very end. So Absolutely. That's what we did, and I, I feel like we we achieved that. Okay. Um, did you find you've you've written so many books prior to this one? Did you find that you're still still able to continue your normal writing process, or was some of that thrown out the window to collaborate with Teresa? How did that work for you? Collaborating is a lot different in that, um, you know, you the whole point is to kind of get away from what your books normally sound like. And that right. was the, the whole goal is to, I was really interested to see what our writing styles would look like meshed together. And not just the writing styles, but our weaknesses and strengths and combine those and um, see, you know, what would come out of that. So okay. I'm not going to say it was easy. It was hard, but in a good way. Um, okay. I really enjoyed the process. Oh, that's great. Uh, was the final product kind of what you guys imagined or even better? How did you... It was better than what I yeah. imagined because both of us were, were bringing things to the table that the other one hadn't thought of. And when we, had, uh, when we hit, hit a wall, one of us would inevitably be able to break through that with an idea and it was just nice to be able to cl collaborate as far as you know plot or timeline and, and things that I'm uh, my writing might see a weakness um, her strength picked up the slack and vice versa oh that's fantastic were you able did you get together often or was this all kind of uh, remotely that you worked together mostly remotely she lives in Georgia and I live in Colorado okay so that's you know, it's not like we could have lunch meetings and, <laughs> right. and talk about timelines and things like that. So um, we did a lot of it remotely, but if there was something that we really needed to discuss at length, we would make the phone call. Okay. Um, you also, uh, your website says you have another one coming out with Teresa in April. Shelf Life, I believe, is the name. Um, well, that was a tentative schedule, and okay. um, so both of us have had projects come up where okay. we've had to push that back. So um, for now, that's not on the schedule at this okay. point in time, but, um, you know, we, we're open to putting it on there later. Okay. Um, you have a really interesting story, I think. Um, I followed you from the beginning, and I think it's so interesting um, what you've done from from being an indie author to working with the publisher back to an indie author. Can you kind of tell us a little more about your journey, how you started, and and ultimately what led you back to self publishing? Well, how I started was my friend told me that I should write a novel. Um, I've always kind of written. I've written. I've journaled. I'm hi, Brandy. I see Brandy on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I've always kind of um, written, I've journaled, I've 
written plays, I've you know written little short stories and even comic book strips. So uh, I've always kind of written, and then in my adult life I blogged. And she told me, you know, your your writing is really engaging. You should just really think about writing a novel. So that conversation spawned my very first novel, Providence, which turned into a trilogy. And at that time, Twilight had the movie had just come out. I read uh, Twilight, and her book was very casual and conversational. And I thought, well, I can do that. You know, I'm not super literary. I can't right. write War and Peace, but you know, I could write <laughs> something similar to Twilight because that was what I liked to read. So okay. you know, I thought because Twilight obviously did so well, I thought you know, well, I could do that. So I wrote Providence, fully expecting it to be the next Twilight. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> when people say, you know, how do you write a book and get past the fear that no one's going to like it or no one's going to read it? And I thought, I've never had that fear. I always thought, you know, that Hollywood would be calling within a couple of weeks. I was really surprised, needless yeah. to say. <laughs> and... Um, but you know, it's it's been a slow growth. It's been a steady growth, and it didn't happen overnight, which I feel like was to my credit, um, growth-wise as an author Absolutely. in my career. So um, I'm sorry, I got totally off track. What's the question? That's okay. Just um, you, maybe your journey on on what led you from you know indie, then you decided to work with a publisher. Yes. So once uh, Beautiful Disaster was the second novel I ever wrote. It was never, I never intended to publish it. I just thought that I was going to write it for me and a couple of my friends that had beta read Providence. And um, it, it didn't have a story arc. It was more like a soap opera where okay. it just had lots of stuff going on all the time. Right. And um, I just had a lot of fun. I read it six times just for entertainment before I finally decided, well, you know, maybe somebody would like this too. So I published it in. Um, May of 2011, okay. and um, a year later it hit the New York Times as indie. And shortly after that, um, the, the publisher started calling me. So I signed a book deal with with Simon and Schuster's uh, division with Adrian Books as the division of Simon and Schuster. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, then I I signed a second book deal with them, which included, included Red Hill. Okay. And um, a Beautiful Wedding and Apollonia and Beautiful Oblivion, which was the first book in the Maddox Brothers books. And then after that, um, I just realized that I really missed. Um, I went back to the Providence trilogy and changed the covers and and changed some pricing and 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 changed a few things. And I realized how much I missed that and how you know my personality is really better suited to be an indie author. I, I still consider myself hybrid. I'm actually working on a book right now called All the Little Lights that um, is a YA, and I think oh. it would be better suited for a publisher. Okay. And so I just I just gauge by the book which which ones I feel like would be better in the indie title and which one would be better um, that maybe something a publisher would be interested in. So okay. I, I'm not, um, I don't consider myself one or the other. I think both experiences have led me to be a better author. Okay. So. Yeah, there's this um, stigma, I think, especially a couple years ago. I think we're just in that in that outflow of, of leaving that stigma behind. And I think, um, I really do think that you've been one of the pioneers in that. And somehow self-publishing has hurt the publishing world when in fact I think it's the opposite. I think it's given books and, and print another life really. Um, is this something that you experienced in the beginning or something that you still experienced? Have you ever found that? Well without indie publishing we wouldn't have Travis Maddox. We wouldn't have Absolutely. Um, books by Colleen Hoover or Abby Glines or Tracy Garvis Graves right. or Tamara Weber or Chris does Kristen Proby indie? I think she does. Jen Armentrout. She is a huge yep. hybrid author. If it weren't for indie, we wouldn't have literally thousands, if not tens of thousands, of really amazing books. So um, true. That have access to those books. So to say, I think there's a lot, and I just posted about this the other day, um, and there, you know, it's a little bit controversial. Yeah. But I, I think that there's a lot of. Um, hasty 
books that are published, mm -hmm. and indie publishing does make that easier to Absolutely. host a book that maybe hasn't been packaged as well as it could be. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's definitely an issue, and it makes it a little harder for readers to wade through and, f and find things that they they enjoy. But that being said, right. I've, I've read some traditional books that are equally poorly packaged and Absolutely. equally published. So I don't think it's primarily an indie issue. I think okay. traditional books traditionally take more time. Yeah. And, um, and they're kind of guided by people who have been doing this for decades. So I think that's where the difference lies. But as far as indie hurting the publishing industry, I couldn't disagree with that more. Yeah, absolutely. How, since you've been in it, have you kind of seen the publishing world change um, for the better, I would hope, um, or if nothing else, you know, given it a second life? But how do you think that since you've been in it till now, there, there's been differences? Wow, it's really changed a lot. Um, yeah. For one thing, because there are so many, I mean, market saturation is real. And when you write okay. a first draft and you publish it the next day without proper editing, um, there, there's literally hundreds of thousands of books out there like that. Um, and, and I understand. Um, I was the same way when I first published. I really just, I was surprised anyone besides my mother. I, I had this <laughs> grandiose idea that it would be a huge Hollywood hit. Um. But deep down, uh, every time someone besides my mother read it, I was genuinely surprised. So I understand not realizing that you have literally the same platform that traditional mm -hmm. publishing has when you publish, but um, market saturation is real. And the difference between when I first started um, is indie publishing, self-publishing was still a dirty word back then. Mm -hmm. Now no one looks to see who the publisher is. If they see right. a book and they see the cover and they see the description and it sounds like something they would enjoy, they buy it. They, they buy it. They don't care who published it. Um, so that's that's a good thing and that's better. But because so many books, literally millions of books, are being um, uploaded since the ebook revolution and self-publishing, um, readers' money is spread out. This makes it harder for authors to make a living at what they do and many authors, especially self-published authors, make less than $500 a year. So um, it, it's, a, it's a lot more competition. It's whereas right. um, where I just had a Facebook page for advertising before I actually have, you know, a, I pay a publicist and I have a marketing strategy. Right. And I have to work a lot harder to get my books out there because Facebook is flooded with mm -hmm. new release here. This new book is coming out next year or in three months, and and um, these same authors are putting out five, six, ten books a year, whereas authors used to put out one. Right. So um, I can't imagine, gosh, what an author is facing if they're just putting out their first book this year. I right. I, I don't want to say it was easier for us and kind of my graduating class of of indie authors, but um, we didn't have the competition that authors have now, and we're we're even feeling the pressure, which is why I think a lot of indie authors are going like Jacinda Wilder just published her first traditional book with a publisher and just signed a book deal. So there's that pre there's a lot more pressure out there absolutely to, with competition and to make a living at what we love to do. Yeah, definitely. And I want to talk a, a couple of minutes about Walmart because I think they've been a huge, um, taken a huge step for, for self-publishing in, in putting uh, Beautiful Redemption physically on their shelves, which is a self-published uh, title. Um, can you talk a little bit about that deal and kind of what that has meant to you at this point in your career? Well, really it meant everything. Um, whether Walmart knows it or not, they, um, they did take a chance on me and I wholly appreciate it. Um, I don't think that they they went into this trying to be you know the champion for right. any books. I just think that they saw a book that was selling well that had a a nice cover and yeah. that had the sales to back it, and they they offered it on their their shelves. It was it was a business decision. I don't think they were trying to be um, trailblazing. Okay. Me on the other hand, I love to do that. <laughs> I would trailblaze all day. Um, I was thrilled to be the first indie author ever to have a, a book on the shelf of a major real retailer. That said, um, Beautiful Redemption was actually um, on shelves by chapters 
in Canada uh, oh, how six, six months before that. So I'd actually done that before, but it was <clears throat> the fact that it was Walmart and they and they were allowing it and right. um, had made that decision and chose my book. Um, I couldn't have been more honored. I, I don't think it was their intent necessarily, <laughs> but um, I'm still honored that they did it. And I, I, I hope that this opens up a l lot of avenues for indie authors to to get their books out on the shelves because people say print is dead. I don't believe that. There's still I can't tell you how many people. I'm one of them that prefer to read print books. I like to have it in my hands. I like yep. the smell. I like, I like the smell of books book stores or books yeah aisles I absolutely um, I like you know flipping the pages so I don't think that print is dead I still think that we're far away from that I just think that print is now in the minority and it will continue to be yeah absolutely is Walmart someone where um, Jamie McGuire fans can go to find more of your print or are you going to continue to do print on demand only Will you continue will with continue. other books in Walmart? Well, here's the thing. Create Space is my print-on-demand company, and they are a subsidiary of Amazon. However, um, they have been instrumental in helping me to get the word out and get my books out there, and they do a great job. And I couldn't say more wonderful okay. things about my folks at Create Space. But yes, of course, I'm interested in getting my books on the shelves. I have thousands of readers that have told me that they found my book for the first time on the mm -hmm. shelf. Our, we live in a vacuum. Yeah. The, our audience, our internet audience, is a fraction of a fraction of our true audience. So I know for a fact that my books being on the shelves is advertising in and of itself. So I would definitely like to see my books on, on the shelves of large retailers, and I will continue to strive to make my books worthy of that, uh, both packaging and the content. And um, I... I they can find them at, Creative, at um, Walmart, and especially Beautiful Redemption, and Beautiful Redemption can actually, if they buy it from Walmart, uh, my readers can send it to me. I've provided an address on my website where I will personalize it and sign it and send that back to them. So if you buy it from Walmart, so cool. send it to me. I'll sign it for you. Go to Walmart, guys. Grab it. You heard it here. Um, well, I'm a huge fan of the Beautiful Disaster series, and... Um, impatiently waiting for for beautiful burn you know it's just so far away in January um, we know it's about the eldest Maddox brother Tyler is there any kind of black plot details at all you can um, discern here or let us know Tyler, what we're Tyler is actually the oldest twin Thomas is the yep. oldest um, Maddox and Tyler um, I kind of want to, to return to my beautiful disaster roots with this book it's the final book in the Maddox Brothers series, and I I miss um, the other brothers have had you know these plot lines that have yeah. really it's kind of been plot driven, and I would I would kind of like to return back to the beautiful disaster um, vibe and have it be relationship driven and um, just that overall feeling that you got from beautiful disaster. So that's where we're going to okay. be going with beautiful burn. Uh, There's well, not going to be so much <laughs> so much plot going on as there is, okay. you know, more relationship and, and character driven. Absolutely. And you've got um, on your website, I saw that there is a follow-up for Trenton and Camille in 2016. Um, probably don't want to talk about that story too much, but are there other stories that you feel um, are deserving of a, continue, a continuation or was there something really special about the two of them that you had to follow it up? Well, you might notice I've never written a sequel for Travis and Abby, and mm -hmm. I didn't do that, and I, despite reader demand, I, I really have stuck to my guns because I just didn't feel like um, there was a story to be written there. I didn't feel, I felt like their story had been told. Right. After I wrote Beautiful Oblivion, <clears throat> I didn't feel that way. I felt like they still had a little bit more um, story left to tell. Okay. So um, I will actually... I haven't decided whether I'm going to write that from Trenton's point of view or from Cammie's. I don't know if it's going to be a sequel or more of a, a switch point of view, but I would rather it be, you know, new material. So it could be both. It could be from Trenton's point of view and a sequel. So we'll see. Oh, okay. That sounds fun. Um, speaking uh, of that topic, do you find it easier 
one point of view over the other? Um, I'm sorry? Do you, sorry, do you find it easier one writing one point of view over the other, whether it's male or female? Is there one that's easier for you? Um, not necessarily. Is my speaker still okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I really, um, Walking Disaster was tough for me because of the timeline. Timeline is not one of my strengths. <laughs> um, so the timeline of it, um, I literally had Beautiful Disaster up on one side of the screen and then Walking Disaster on the other. And I was very, very pregnant at the time also. I literally turned in Walking Disaster and then gave birth to my, in the morning and gave birth oh, to my gosh. son that night. So um, it, it was tough for me. It was emotionally draining for me. But I feel like writing through Travis's eyes was easier for me. I feel like the frat boy, you know, vernacular and the insults and it was liberating being a guy, you know, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of a testament to how much farther we as women have to go because I didn't have to worry about if Travis said something, if somebody was going to be offended. It was like, oh, you know, that's Travis and he's a dude, you know. So um, I, I really enjoyed writing Travis's point of view, and I've, I've enjoyed writing. I have um, a male point of view in my book, Red Hill, that I really enjoyed, too. But, it, I mean, he, his personality can be more different. But I, I do really enjoy writing the male point of view. And in, in Sweet Nothing, the chapters go back and forth between the male point of view and the female point of view. And when Teresa and I worked on that together, um, on the male point of view, I really enjoyed writing that. So, mm. I wouldn't say it's easier, but it's more entertaining for me as a writer. I'm not really sure why I don't do it more often. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I have to ask uh, on behalf of every Beautiful Disaster fan out there um, who are probably on the edge of their seats wondering if there's any information on a movie in the works, um, any comment at all for that? Well... I only get about 1,200 questions about the movie a day, so <laughs> I'm glad that we're talking about this. Um, oh, good. I'm, I'm excited about a movie, too, and I really would love to see Travis and Abby on the big screen. I would love to see Abby and Travis as a Netflix series or an HBO series, yes. Yes. but um, I want it to be done right, and I'm willing to wait until that's possible. That could possibly mean that it never gets done. But I think that my readers are, my readers agree with me and that they would rather wait than do it quick and just have it up on the screen and then it be. Absolutely. So it is not a production right now. I did sign with, um, with Warner Brothers three years ago and their option went out. I have not re-signed with anybody else. I haven't um, went with another producer. We have spoken to several people. It's um, A lot of people are looking at it, but again, I've been through the process once, so I kind of know what to expect. And um, I, w I just want to make sure that it's done right. I, I, I refuse to let it be done in a way that I feel like will offend my readers because they've invested so much of their emotion and time into this book. So it, it would be tragic to... And it's happened. It I've seen it happen, and it is it is a tragedy, I think. Yeah, Absolutely. I agree. So I'm willing to be um, We're there with you. <laughs> we are. Um, you've released... Four books since May, you've got three more coming in 2016. Well, the four books are coming soon. Uh, how do you find the time? How do you write so much and you're still with your family? And how do you do it all? Well, first of all, I need to say disclaimer. Um, I get really excited about books when I put it up on my schedule, and then reality sets in, and I realize... <laughs> how little time I actually have. So that schedule on my website, I should probably put a disclaimer up there that it is tentative. tentative. Um, I really just write what speaks to me at the time as opposed to my schedule. I try to keep with my schedule, but um, especially here lately, since I've moved to Colorado from Oklahoma, it's been a lot more difficult to write. There's so many things to do in Steamboat Springs, and <laughs> Um, my family is always wanting to go out and do things, and I've actually flipped. I used to be a night writer, 
and I've uh -huh. actually flipped my schedule, and I write during the day, so, you know, when I can get my kids up and around for school as opposed to my husband, so my little girls can actually have braids and look pretty, <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, so I've been writing during the day, but I have not been able to be as productive as I was when I wrote at night, so I don't have anything concrete planned besides okay. all the little lights after Beautiful Burn. Okay. So, um, we'll just have to see which character speaks to me. Okay, so we're staying tuned. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah. How do you I, I kind of miss, when I first started writing, I kind of miss um, just writing and putting out the book and not having this deadline to work against. That's, right. It's part of the job, but then again, it kind of sucks all the fun out of it. So yeah. I think after a beautiful burn, I would just kind of like to write something and then, you know, people will know when it comes out. I like that. Oh, that's exciting. Um, how do you, you've got so many stories and you have so many stories, how do you keep them all straight? Do you have a system? Do you have a way of writing it down? Do you just keep it in your head? How do you do it? I do write it down. I have lots and lots of notes. Um, my publicist, Megan, can tell you that um, <laughs> I have notes literally all over my office um, and none of them are in any order. So I do write things down a lot. I write them down on my phone or I'm on my iPad, whatever's closest. But for the most part, it's all up here. I, I have little scenes and stuff written on my notes, but I know the basicness. But it doesn't really matter how much I keep in my brain because by the, when I start writing it, it always changes. Oh, that's so interesting. Out of all of your series, is there a series that sticks out or a book of out of any of the series that sticks out as a favorite among the rest? Mine? Absolutely. Red Hill. Yeah. Why? Um, well, the the main female character, Scarlet, she is a mother of two daughters. Um, she's an x-ray tech like I used to be before I, I quit my day job to be a writer. And um, she uh, she's probably more based on me. It's probably a tie between her and Travis um, than any of my other characters. So I, I really like, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm a huge zombie fan and I, I love The Walking Dead, but I came up with this idea before I ever started watching it. But um, I'm just, I've always been a fan of, you know, post-apocalyptic zombies, survival, right. huge survival buff. So um, I, it was my favorite to write. I feel like it's my best written book as far as, you know, my writing is concerned. And I, I, I can relate to it. And it has all the things in it that I enjoy personally. So for me, that is my favorite. Okay. What kind of advice, and you mentioned before you don't know how it could be to be releasing a book right now for your debut. What about for the authors that aren't quite sure where to start? Do you have any kind of advice for them? I do. I have an entire FAQ for writers on my website, jamiemaguire.com. And it's basically a step-by-step -step of what you should do and what you should not do. And um, I update it about twice a year, so I try to okay. keep it you know, up to date. But first of all, you have to finish your book. I have seen so many authors out there um, creating GoFundMes for a book they haven't started. I've seen authors out there that are, have um, posted you know, release dates and covers for books that aren't finished. Mm -hmm. um, if it's your first book, I would highly recommend finishing it first because all the best intentions in the world are not going to get that book done. <laughs> right. So, so sure. Um, finish the book. Finish what you start because that's the main step for most people, including me. Before I started writing, I was really surprised that I could finish one book, and now I'm getting ready to start my 20th. So um, it, it's a lot harder than it sounds finishing a book. And every time I'm surprised and shocked and in awe that I finished, I completed a full novel. But um, it, there's just so many people that are aspiring authors, and they need. To put it bluntly, stop being an aspiring author and, and finish your book and be an author, and then you can perfect your craft. Then you can start marketing. Then you can start building your audience. Because unless you have a product to sell, you can't sell it. Absolutely. Great advice. Thank you for that. 
Do you have a reading list that's currently um, maybe on your bedside table or something that you're, you're in the middle of or dying to get to? I have a huge TBR. I'm not any different than any other you. I have a huge TBR, but then I feel guilty when I'm reading because I feel like I should be writing. Right. So I don't read as often as I used to. I don't read um, very often at all. Right now I'm reading Unrivaled by mm -hmm. Alyssa Noel, and her writing is spectacular. She's a new young adult author, and um, I'm in awe of her writing. I finished You by Carolyn Kempnis. Um, a couple months ago, and that just blew me away. I've never, no offense, to, I hope her name is Caroline. Carolyn, I'm not sure the pronunciation of her name, and I hate to offend her because I think she's just a brilliant individual. But um, I haven't met her or spoken to her, but I, I've never re read a book before where I didn't like any of the characters, I didn't like the plot line, but the writing was so brilliant. I mean, morally, I didn't like the plot line. Right. Everything... The, the woman is brilliant. Her writing just kind of made me want to quit. I mean, <laughs> that's how good it was. So um, I really, really loved you, even though I didn't like the characters or really the, the, um, the ending. But um, I, I loved the writing. It was so bizarrely intriguing and sucked me in. And so then also I've read... Um, my mind just went blank. Um, I don't want to get this wrong, but um, a book by Atria, my mind just went completely blank. I'll think of it in a minute. Okay. Um, you just had a fun retreat at your, you hosted at your home, I believe. Um, how did that go, and what was, what was the ultimate point of it? What did you do there? Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I was super nervous. Um, I have a big house. Um, we just moved, and my house okay. before was super tiny. But um, now I have a bigger house, so I thought, you know, it would be fun to have readers over. Okay. And um, it ended up being like 25 women. And um, so we asked them to bring, you know, like, we didn't have beds for everybody. So they were like, we don't care. So they brought, you know, blow up mattresses and sleeping bags. And some people slept on the couches. and. Um, in the recliners, and I have a media room which has um, the theater seats that lean back, and so we had, you know, eight people in there, and Ooh. it was just, um, it, there were so many things that could have gone just comically wrong, <laughs> because, you know, it's not a hotel, so I was afraid right. about the plumbing, I was afraid about the hot water. These women, these, these 24 women that I had come, um, they were so considerate of each other, there was, a, everyone's like, oh, you know, there were that many women together. That must have been <laughs> no, there was, everybody talked to everybody. There was no clickiness. There was nobody that felt left out. Everybody had a great time. We cried a lot because we were just that happy. Mm -hmm. And um, we just hung out. And it was so laid back. We, 25 women made it to dinner on time. Dinner, dinner reservation. <laughs> um, and just everybody was just so considerate of each other, and there was just so much positive energy. And I was blown away by how well it went, so much so that I want to do it again. So, yeah, um, I I loved every second of it. I was really sad when they left. I figured yeah. on Sunday I'd be like, "Whew, got my house back to myself." Right. You know that I you know because at book signings especially, I put out so much energy after two, four, six hours yeah. of a book signing. I'm exhausted. So I was really pleasantly surprised on Sunday when they were leaving, and I was like, I'm not ready to leave me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I miss every single one of them, and I, I truly believe that I made, you know, 24 really close friendships over that weekend. Wow. How did you pick the women, or how did they become the ones who got to go? Well, we had um, – if people pre-ordered the books, we sent out, what we did was, um, we sent out, well, we only had a few. So we sent out golden tickets within those pre-orders of those paperbacks. And of course, you know, we, because people were coming to my house, we um, checked that we were familiar or someone else was at least a little bit familiar with that person. Okay. Um, because, you know, there are security concerns and privacy Absolutely. concerns and things like that. So that was a factor. But yes, that's how we did it. Okay, so interesting. Well, the next one sounds like maybe it'll be even more fun. I hope so. I know. <laughs> um, we have sadly uh, come to the end of our time. 
Um, I just want to remind everyone, jamiemaguire.com. You can find her on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and go out November 1st, get sweet nothing, and um, love every second of it. And we wait for, for all of the next ones to come. <laughs> yes, you can find the pre-order links to sweet nothing on my website. And also buy those books. From Beautiful Redemption, if you want to keep seeing new books on the shelves. Yes, absolutely. Go to Walmart. Go to Walmart. Thank you so much, Jamie. This was a blast. And um, thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.